Welcome back to GBN America with me, Patrick Christie's Now with Donald Trump so far ahead in the polls, President Biden is having to make some serious policy changes to get his campaign back on track. And one of those policy changes relates to electric vehicles. And it looks as though he is slowing down the mandate in sales and looking to delay that until after 2030. Here to discuss all of this with me is Ethan Berman of the Ethan Berman firm, the owner and attorney at. Ethan, thank you very much for joining me. Oh, Patrick, it is wonderful to join you. Thanks for having me on. So look, I'm keen to get your views on the very latest from the EV world, OK, over there, because uh, I believe that President Joe Biden's administration is now considering making a change, OK? And rather than mandating a rapid increase in electric vehicles in the coming years, they're looking at delaying this. Do you think this is a good thing? Yeah, I think it's a reasonable response to the marketplace. Uh, they started with aggressive goals. They're pouring billions of dollars into building out things like the charging infrastructure in the very large and, and sparse and diverse United States. Um, and uh, that's taking longer than everybody has expected. So a, a little reasonable uh, backpedal is, is right, in, right in the course as it should be. Is this something that's going to help Joe Biden in the polls or is it an admittance maybe that they're caving into the kind of Republican side of things that wanted to slow all of this down anyway? Well, I think it's I think it's I don't think this hurts him at the polls, but I think that there is a little bit of the caving and, and the caving is really this. There's been a tremendous FUD campaign, fear, uncertainty and doubt uh, around uh, EVs here in the United States in particular. And um, some of it is founded, such as the charging infrastructure issues, but the majority really are not. And uh, new internal combustion engine vehicles are, are, have just as many problems, although when you look at the data, you look at the headline from, from Nielsen, uh, excuse me, J.D. Powers, that says that there are more problems in EVs, those are minor software glitches because you're rolling out a new platform. But in terms of recalls, um, it is significant that internal combustion engine vehicles have just as many issues as EVs. What about the cost, though, for the consumer? I mean, we've got a bit of a problem over here where, frankly, people might want to get an electric vehicle, but they just can't afford it. Yeah, that, that's a huge issue that you just brought up, Patrick. I think this is the right one. So in the United States, at least, we started with a kind of the high end and luxury for electric vehicles and and or loaded with all the latest new gadgets and technology. So it's going to cost more. Um, furthermore, uh, even regular cars, again, the prices are up high. Interest rates are up tremendously. That's affecting all new car buyers, not just for EVs. But importantly, Patrick, and this is where the UK, the EU and the United States need to get their act together. The Chinese are subsidizing. The Chinese are ready to flood the global EV marketplace and they're ready to dominate and destroy our entrenched automotive industries like they've done with others. And so we need to band together um, and whatever the trade trade deals and trade alliances need to look like, we need to focus on protecting our industries against the Chinese undercutting and dumping in our markets. Yeah, I mean, that would be a really smart way of going about it, using our natural allies to pull together to make sure that we don't resist a common enemy, as it were, but certainly a, a common enemy when it comes to the market forces, at least. But this growth of electric vehicles has heightened concerns about China's current dominance when it comes to the actual resources behind a lot of this stuff. The lithium batteries being a key element uh, of this. I mean, as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, the US government is spending money providing tax credits to companies that are attempting to build up a domestic supply chain. Look, how concerned should we be if China's grasp on the resources behind this? Um, the good news is in the United States now, we have multiple discoveries of massive deposits of both things like lithium and other rare earth minerals. I think China's dominance and control of these materials is going to be ending soon. And the United States, South America and other you know, more reasonable market um, partners uh, will lead in this area very soon. And I would add to that, uh, Patrick, that 
Um, our battery technology, as it's developing, is reducing the reliance on these minerals that are sourced mostly or or refined mostly in China. So we're making really good progress and headway. That doesn't mean for the next three to five years it's going to be problematic. But I think after five years, we're going to be in a good place. Well, you mentioned there about the batteries and battery life as well. I know this is something that uh, former President Donald Trump has been very, very dismissive of. I mean, he's been quite flippant, hasn't he, saying, oh, you know, these cars can't really go that far on one charge, etc. Is he being a bit simplistic there, do you think? I do. And I think that he's looking backwards as opposed to forwards. We have multiple car manufacturers now, Western ones and Korean ones, who, again, are good trading partners of ours, who are are stating that they have cars coming out that are going to have up to 600 miles of range. And remember, the average American commute, daily commute for work, is approximately 41 miles round trip. So if you're able to charge your car overnight, um, it's just not an issue. The issue is if you want in the United States, we like to road trip. And that's where the problems come in with our infrastructure and the potential range issues. Is it becoming increasingly difficult to make the environmental case for a lot of these electric vehicles? Because it appears to me that certainly here in Britain anyway, obviously much, much, much smaller landmass than you guys over there, incredibly so. But we could essentially sink into the sea tomorrow and not exist. And as long as countries like China and India continue to pump out carbon emissions at the rate that they're doing, it wouldn't make a blind bit of difference to the actual global emissions. So is it difficult to try now to to tell people that, look, you need to do your bit to reduce your personal carbon emissions when everybody knows that some of these massive countries, they're not going to do their bit. Therefore, what's the point? Yeah, I I think that that's a very reasonable argument. And at the same time, I can walk and chew gum. So what that means is we do need to do things in our own countries. Um, First off, we have to get off this anti-nuclear kick that seems to have taken hold in the West Mm -hmm. here. Um, Here in the United States, we just licensed a brand new molten salt reactor design uh, to be fully tested out for commercial capabilities in Tennessee. The future is very bright. Um, I would also add that China, again, because of the autocratic nature of their government, they rolled out more solar generating capacity last year, just in China, as more than the rest of the world combined. So China's getting on board what they need to do. You know, the the last remaining large country really is India that we need to focus on. Yeah, I mean, China is doing absolutely all sorts of stuff, including even putting things like a fake moon in the sky to help with overnight crop production. But I suppose that's the trade off that you get when you do have that kind of authoritarian regime that you were just mentioning. But Ethan, thank you very, very much. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I really hope to talk to you again very, very soon about this issue. It's Ethan Behrman there, who is the owner and attorney at the Behrman firm. Thank you very, very much. We were hearing there about the amount of pressure that former President Trump was putting on Joe Biden over electric vehicles. But former President Trump is under a fair bit of pressure himself, especially financially, because he has now been fined a total of four hundred and forty million dollars. That, by the way, is before interest. And apparently there is more to come. To explain exactly what is going on here is the wonderful Lauren Chen, who is the host at Blaze TV, Mediaholic and the pseudo intellectual. Lauren, it's bad news for Trump. Personally, I think this entire farce is completely political. And for people who are following along, it might be a little bit confusing as to which action against Trump we are specifically talking about. So to bring everyone up to speed, in Fulton County, Trump essentially is being accused of uh, treason, election interference, and that's a RICO case that's going on. You also have the civil case by E. Jean Carroll, who is alleging that years and years ago, uh, Trump basically assaulted her. And now with this New York case, the core of it is is that Donald Trump has allegedly inflated the value of his assets and his businesses in order to get more preferable loans from banks. Now, the loans in question were repaid completely to the satisfaction of the banks. However, that was not enough to the satisfaction of this one particular judge, who a lot of people do believe, yes, is using his his seat on the bench as a form of activism specifically to bankrupt Donald Trump in the hopes that he's not able to run for president. Could you just tell me a little bit about this judge? I mean, Alina Haber is an attorney for Donald Trump, has condemned the ruling, saying that it is a politically fueled witch hunt. And obviously a single, seemingly politically aligned judge has been able to find 
former President Trump guilty of such a serious offence without a trial. Right. It's very concerning if you're interested in the American legal system's impartiality. So to be clear, this is a judge who, without any jury trial, has deemed Donald Trump guilty of committing fraud. And not just that, but he has, as you mentioned, in, instilled this ludicrous, uh, this ludicrous amount of money that Trump now has to pay back. This screams political motivation. And I think for anyone who's paying attention, it's also unclear what exactly definition of fraud the judge is operating under. Uh, from what I understand, Trump's legal team intends very much to appeal this ruling. But it's also been explained by people who are better versed in the financial world than I am that this judge, in his ruling, uh, trying to ascertain how much Trump allegedly owes this these banks, it, he also did something ludicrous, like evaluate the the value of the Mar-a-Lago estate, uh, which people have said is you know, hundreds of millions of dollars at a mere seventy five million dollars. So, just on multiple fronts, the fact that this is even being uh, an issue in court, the fact that this judge is 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 a Democrat, it, it all screams political motivation. And I think the fact that all of these charges against Trump, again, not just this specific case, but this is all coming to head in 2024. That's not a coincidence. No, but just practically speaking, what kind of implication will this have on former President Trump and his ability to operate? Well, I think practically speaking, the result will be as intended by this judge and by all the other activists out there who are hungry for Donald Trump's blood. This is going to bog down his resources in nonsensical legal fees, as well as take up valuable time he has that could be better spent doing things like campaigning. And I mean, it's it, it's, it's sort of annoying that simultaneously we have the whole Fannie, Will, uh, Fannie Williams, or sorry, Fannie Willis case, because there you have almost, uh, I guess, things flipped around. You have someone who is definitely corrupt, who has used her position of power for ill gains and uh, you know, on the one hand, Donald Trump is being tried by the media for merely having taken out loans and paying them back when it comes to Fannie Willis, because she is, of course, a strong black African-American woman who is against Trump. Uh, she seemingly can do no wrong in the media's eyes. Yeah, well, let's move on now to Fannie Willis, because it was quite dramatic, really. So the Fulton County District Attorney, that being Fannie Willis, took to the stand to defend her ability to lead the Georgia election interference case last week. I mean, it's been an incredibly contentious and quite salacious trial, actually. Uh, she testified, um, and, uh, I mean, she was quite dramatic, wasn't she? Do you want to just tell us what happened? I believe that she, she stormed into the courtroom to take the stand, and then everything that she said on the stand appeared to be uh, pretty dramatic as well. Oh, it was absolutely dramatic for people who missed out. I highly recommend you check it out. It, it seemed more like watching a daytime soap opera rather than actual footage from a court trial. And if, if people aren't aware of what is going on with the Fannie Willis case, she is the person essentially who has decided that Donald Trump is guilty of election interference, or she's going to try to convince the court that he is. And uh, the reason why she is now being questioned is because for this case, which obviously is very high profile, uh, you know, you are trying attempting to try try a, a former president. Uh, she chose her, I'm not sure if current or former lover, as one of the lawyers to be brought on a special prosecutor for this case. Uh, now, obviously, like I said, high profile case, you would assume that this person would be very qualified having tried RICO cases previously. That is not the case. And not only was he completely unqualified to be a part of this case, he somehow was also being, uh, being billed at a way higher rate than lawyers on the team who actually had experience. So all of this just seems very, very corrupt. And it raises a lot of eyebrows, which is why Fannie Willis is being questioned. Uh, but if you ask her what exactly is going on, she would rather tell people that she is simply being persecuted for being, you know, an outspoken black mm. woman who is trying to hold Donald Trump accountable. But does this just expose a double standard, though? I mean, if former President Trump was accused of exactly the same thing, I mean, goodness, nobody knows where it would end up. Well, it would end up in court, wouldn't it? Let's be honest. I mean, do you think there has been a double standard here? Because the media, from what I can tell, certainly the left-wing media, appear to be all over Fanny Willis. Oh, there is absolutely a double standard here. And to be clear, for people who haven't watched the trial, uh, it's not me bringing up the race card. Fannie Willis was more than happy to do that herself. And she has been consistently playing the race card in order to explain why she is being brought in for all of these questions. And I, I don't think it's... 
it's surprising to say that this is a double standard to anyone. I feel like anyone who is watching the simultaneous uh, treatment of Donald Trump versus Fannie Willis can tell that there is uh, two very different standards. It seems like Donald Trump is guilty until proven innocent, regardless of whether he's actually done anything in the first place, regardless of whether there are even any victims in the case. Uh, the, the the civil fraud case, the banks themselves are, are not on board with the idea of do- charging Trump for any fraud for a loan that he did pay them back for. Whereas when you look at Fannie Willis, uh, I think the taxpayers at Fulton County are looking at the charges that are being incurred uh, under this frankly sham of a trial and they're raising their eyebrows and I think it's also worth mentioning that there has recently been a whistleblower from Fannie Willis's office uh, who has been let go previously who has also spoken again spoken out about the office's mismanagement and mishandling of funds so this is a woman who it seems like has a history of using her position in order to financially benefit herself and in some cases uh, her associates and still she is being heralded as this this champion of justice by the left and by the media i think if if, if you're paying attention it's very clear anyone who is for trump including trump himself bad guilty persecute anyone who is against Trump, including Fannie Willis, uh, brave. Uh, sh- she can do no wrong, and we should protect her at all costs. Yeah, it's absolutely staggering to see unfold in real time. Let's just return to uh, former President Trump, please, because he, he's made quite an interesting foray into the fundraising world, again, hasn't he, with these golden trainers, or I suppose, as you would say over there, sneakers. Um, uh, apparently, they're $399. And is he doing this just to pay for legal fees? Is he what's going on here? I mean, Donald Trump is someone who, uh, even though he's very active in the political world, has also been, uh, you know, keeping keeping at the forefront of culture as well. He was on The Apprentice. He was uh, he launched his own series of NFTs, from what I understand. So I guess Trump sneakers aren't necessarily a surprise or a huge departure from that. And you know what? Simultaneously, I will say, even if he is doing this simply to fundraise, I understand why I think the man is on the hook for basically like a billion dollars at this point. So, you know, I. If this was just a money grab, I don't think I would necessarily blame him. But from what I've seen, and I'm not someone who pretends to be an expert on fashion, uh, but the kids are saying it's hip, that they're cool. They look good. They're good looking sneakers. Uh, They're pretty snazzy. So, hey, if you if you are a Trump fan and you're looking for new sneakers, why not buy them and maybe help them and out of a, a, a really tough legal situation he's in at the same time? Look, I know our very own Nigel Farage is currently in America at CPAC, so I fully expect at some point to see him presenting a show wearing some of Donald Trump's golden sneakers. But um, look, Trump has broken his silence on Navalny's death. Now, this has caused massive international global headlines. Okay, From what I can gather, he hasn't really placed any particular blame on Putin. Nikki Haley has come out and said, instead he stole a page from the Liberals' playbook denouncing America and comparing our country to Russia. What do you make of what former President Trump has said about Navalny's death? Well, I think for someone in Trump's situation where he is not currently a a sitting president, he has no more access to intel than the average person. I think it was a pretty reasonable statement. And I, I know this might Raise, uh, raise some questions amongst your viewers, but I'm personally looking at the way that the Biden administration has weaponized Navalny's death as a way to attempt to fundraise uh, more aid to Ukraine. And I'm starting to wonder, mm. is, is this a little bit con- convenient? I'm not sure. I mean, we look at what happened with the Nord Stream pipeline. I wouldn't put it past the CIA uh, to, let's just say, take action themselves in order to shore up support for uh, America's participation in the war in Ukraine. But I mean, moving on to Trump's statement, he, I I, I think, very reasonably tried to compare the situation in Russia, which we can all agree is is not an all right one if you're persecuting uh, political dissidents, and was trying to use the situation to shine a light on the United States, because I know uh, war hawks like Nikki Haley, they love to focus internationally. They care so much about what is going on outside of America's borders. But I think a lot of people uh, who feel represented by Trump, they're looking at Russia and they're thinking, well, is that really that much different than what we are seeing in the United States? Don't forget, we are still looking at January 6th uh, defendants who are in jail, who are being held for trumped up charges. We also have the likes of Derek Chauvin, whose trial was absolutely political. And again, 
Trump himself is going through all these legal motions as well as uh, some of his uh, former associates, uh, people like Jenna Ellis, because of this uh, this allegation of election interference. I personally agree with Donald Trump that, uh, yes, the, the death is terrible and should be condemned, but also what is going on within America's borders are, are, are much more pressing issues mm. for the American people. Yeah, you mentioned things like an aid bill there, and it brings me perfectly on to this, because Joe Biden, the current president, has expressed willingness to meet with House Speaker Mike Johnson to discuss a $95 billion aid package for Ukraine. I mean, it does feel, from my perspective, by the way, like every single time I talk to somebody in America, we are discussing a different massive aid bill for Ukraine. But apparently it passed by the Senate in a bipartisan vote last week. Um, Johnson, who controls the Republican House, is yet to bring the package to vote. I mean, do do Americans now feel as though they still have a duty to support Ukraine? Where are you guys at on this? From from what I feel, speaking to the average American and especially online, you can hear people's voices loud and clear. They are tired of the gravy train for Ukraine, and that's not any any slight against the Ukrainian people, who uh, you know I'm sure everyone our hearts go out to them, seeing what's happening to their country. But at the same time, the American taxpayer has plenty of other financial obligations, and seeing the, seeing Congress pass you know, bill after bill, trilli- uh, sorry, billions and billions of dollars uh, to send overseas. It's frustrating for the American taxpayer. By the way, tax season is coming up. I think there are a lot of families who are going to be looking at the amount of money that they're sending the government. And instead of maybe thinking, okay, well, at least this is going to our social security. At least this is paving our roads, uh, going to support our veterans. A lot of people are going to be looking, I think, with some very well-earned yeah. uh, resentment, knowing that a good chunk of that money is actually going overseas to you know, al- align the pockets of the military-industrial complex for a war that a lot of, a lot of americans think we shouldn't even be involved in in the first place one thing i will say to that though lauren is i suppose is it a really good thing though for the reputation of america and republicans if an ally is not defended well, to that, I would ask what exactly constitutes an ally. Again, this is not meant as a slight against the Ukrainian people themselves. But if we're yeah. looking at the Ukrainian government, does does being an American ally simply mean that our, our politicians use their politicians to funnel money back into their own pockets? Because, I mean, looking at the Biden relationship with Ukraine, I, I guess that's, that's the definition we're going with. Uh, you know, we often hear in defense of funding Ukraine that we must stand up for democratic values, Western values. Let's not forget that an American, an American, American journalist has died in the in in custody of Ukrainian officials, and there hasn't been much word from that from uh, the U- officials themselves or from the American government on that. It just seems yeah. very curious as to, uh, you know who the United States chooses to be an ally and when exactly they choose to back up those allies. And, you know, this this is, frankly, I think a tired narrative for the American people, the idea that they need to be funding every foreign conflict. I mean, uh, there are other members in NATO, not just the United States. And of course, I know Europe is, uh, you know, obviously do- donating resources and weapons as well. But I think considering how far especially the United States is from all of this, a lot of people are watching this unfold and wondering why. why Why are we still involved in this? Why are we still sending resources? And what do we have to gain by, frankly, uh, continuing to prolong this war, which we now understand there was an out. uh, There was an out possible two years ago that, of course, uh, the U.S. and the U.K. shut down. Why exactly? Well, I think we have to look to uh, their donors to understand that. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. Until next time, that is Lauren Chen there, of course, who is a host at Blaze TV, Mediaholic and the Pseudo Intellectual Shows. Well, for more from GBN America, just go to gbnews.com forward slash America.